I think we'll just have to get started and um, we can let in the latecomers. So um, just so you know that um, I've got Maddie with me today from Creative Bloom and Hello. she's being my lovely assistant. So she'll be keeping an eye on the chat for questions and she will also be letting um, people in like if you get chucked out for any reason or any late comments, etc. So if you've got any problems, then just drop her a note in, in the chat and she will help you out. Um, if you don't mind muting yourselves all for now, and then I will take some questions at the end if, if you have any. So um, just to introduce the series, if you haven't been to any of these before, this is the Recover and Mind SME Digital Accelerator Programme. We have a whole bunch of more than 25 different webinars that are being run to help small businesses get up to speed uh, with their digital marketing and all sorts of other things like um, technology and productivity and systems, etc. And this is the beginning of series two. So this topic today is all about brand and branding. And I will just run through the next few so that you know what's coming up in the next um, few weeks of the series. So We've got next week, we've got two, we've got one on customer marketing strategy and also the first of the digital focus, which is on search engine marketing. And then after that, we've got sessions on social media, which is me again, and uh, data security and GDPR, always um, an area that people need a bit more information on, measuring marketing ROI, a special masterclass for the visitor economy sector, and then a nice networking Q&A like panel session at the end of the series. And then obviously that's not it, there was series three and series four. So do log on to Eventbrite and have a look at the whole lot. If there's, there might be something else that you want to um, book a space for. So to begin on today's topic, um, we are just going to run a quick poll um, about your understanding of branding at the moment. Now, I'm hoping by the end of this, then your uh, choices will be a bit different. But if you could just take part in this poll and say how confident you are with your brand understanding of branding at the current time, that'd be great. Thank you. Seeing lots of lovely answers coming in. Well, that's good to see because if you're all confident, then I'd be wondering why you were here today. So um, could be better is, is a good answer. There's a few more. So can everyone see the poll? We're just waiting for a few more to take part in that. Give us a shout if you can't. Okay, we'll end it there. Thank you very much for that. I'll share the results for you. And we can see that more than half of you um, would like to have a better understanding of, of brands. So hopefully we can, we can get that sorted for you today. Right. So this explanation I, I really like is from a renowned uh, London marketing agency called Interbrand. And I think it, it really does sum up uh, what a brand really is and that it's not actually just one thing, but it's uh, more of a collection. And some of those things are actually intangible things as well. So a brand is a combination of properties within and outside an offering that gives it an identity and makes it distinct from others. The modern practice of branding started in the late 1800s when Coca-Cola decided to differentiate its products from other generic companies by painting everything in its brand colour, developing the patented designs of its bottles and printing logos on company-owned products. Now, given the fact that most of the markets today are saturated with companies offering similar products and services, developing a brand has become imperative to develop a favourable perception and stand out in that crowd. So to explain this further, let's just have a quick look at Costa versus Starbucks. Now we know that they are different visually, of course, but Costa is the UK leader. And why is that? 
Both coffee companies sell coffee, tea, cold drinks, snacks, and lunch items. Both brands have casual and familiar in-store environments, and both have charitable foundations. So what is it that sets them apart? Well, one thing is the coffee itself, of course, the taste, but also the science behind it. Starbucks baristas understand the differences between coffee types, and they have to become certified following extensive training to make drinks in a Starbucks location. Another is the customer serving time. Starbucks staff have to get every customer served within three minutes or up to five for peak times. Whereas us Brits, well, you know, we almost enjoy queuing, don't we? So Costa staff are not quite in such a hurry. Now, some consumers don't like the way that Starbucks have muscled their way into highly independent shopping areas of the UK. And others believe that Costa just care so much more about the environment. But as you can see, each brand comes with a set of identifiers, but also perceptions based on its behavior and its products. While there is one definition of brand, the concept application differs for different aspects. So generally a brand is categorized into three overall types. These are personal branding, which applies to famous personalities, CEOs of companies that perhaps have other interests and actions such as other companies or politics, thought leadership work, etc. And it's about developing a brand of their own, so differentiate, differentiating them from other people. An offering brand is when an identity is built around a tangible or intangible offering and it's referred to as an offering brand. So this offer or offering can be anything from a product, service, to a place, event, or a cause. And then there's the corporate brand. So this is the brand of the parent company that deals with the offering. Usually a large single company offers more than just one branded offering. So in these cases, a corporate brand is also developed to differentiate the corporate identity from the brand identity. Now the vision, values, personality and positioning approach is a clear way to form a brand. So even if you already have a company, you can revisit each section above and see if you have any gaps or can strengthen in a particular area. So in my experience, it's often the positioning that is lacking. And as I've explained, creating a brand does involve far more than designing a logo and the visual identity side. A true brand is a shorthand way of expressing, expressing a promise to a market and articulating this promise involves a series of steps. The key thing is to create a brand expression which is true to the nature of the business and to the founders of that business. And without this element of truth, trust, which is the cornerstone of any relationship, it cannot be built. Now, following um, by following the VV PP pathway, I have to be careful how I say that so I don't get it wrong, the result should be a clear articulation of what your brand stands for and how this translates for your customers. It also informs many decisions and you can see there that the first couple of parts, they are part of your planned identity and then the second later two parts are how the brand is actually seen by consumers. Having a brand strategy is very important. And here's why brand strategy becomes before brand design. So without strategy backing your design, any visual representation of your brand will likely be based on a whim, something uh, that's unsystematic, um, decisions perhaps based on you know, what's currently trending. Brand strategy is the foundation of brand design. In this way and this way only, your visual story becomes useful and engaging. Following a successful brand strategy, you will then have to find your target audience, how to reach them and how to speak to them. Now come the visual elements, so all of which are informed by the brand strategy. A strong brand identity will set you apart visually, but also conveys what your company stands for. Whereas a company mission statement is about what you do, for who and how, um, what is your goal and also have a focus on today, 
The vision is about what your company wants to become. So it shapes the culture and describes what success looks like. The focus there is on tomorrow. A vision statement describes what a company would like to achieve in the long term, generally in a time frame of five to 10 years, or sometimes it's even longer. It depicts a vision of what the company will look like in the future and sets a defined direction for planning and execution of business strategies. There's just a few examples on the screen there of different vision companies from well-known brands. The main elements of an effective vision statement are that it is forward-looking, that it's motivating and inspirational, that it's reflective of a company's culture and core values, that it's aimed at bringing benefits and improvements to the organisation in the future, but also that it defines a company's reason for existence and where it is heading. Brand values are guiding principles that drive both your brand's internal culture and its external connection. They are marks of how you act, what you stand for and against, and how you communicate with your customers. Brand values are an integral part of a properly unified brand. Our values are what guide us to be who we are, how we act, um, act, you know, sorry, act how we act, um, draw the line when we feel something has gone perhaps too far and also continually influence our thoughts and actions. So it's no different for your brand that these core guiding principles are how you and your team should be when representing your brand. They should act as pillars that help you in, in how to act when working on your brand's mission, towards your brand's vision, and they should tie in directly with your brand's purpose. And I will explain brand purpose a little bit later. It's this mix of internal principles, thriving brand culture and aligned messaging that will go towards building a differentiated approach for your company in the marketplace that could not usually be authentically copied by competitors because you can't fake the culture and the relationships that brand values authentically build. Now, how to develop brand values. So when you pick a word that truly resonates, you should aim to use it in a short phrase that describes how the value is core to the brand. Your value should communicate to your clients what it will be like to work with you. So Airbnb is a great example of this, and they've just updated them this year to connection and belonging, creatively led, and responsibility to our stakeholders, which they communicate in a founder's letter on their website. You can avoid the mandatory values unless they add extra value. So, for example, if you were a finance company handling people's money, you would be expected to be trustworthy. So you might choose a value that's centered around integrity or transparency, as this is really what the customer is looking for. And that value of uh, just being um, you know, trustworthy is actually a given, you know, don't, don't include that, go for something that means a bit more. If you need help getting started, then there is a list of 50 values on the jamesclear.com website. And I know that Maddie's just going to post, post that link into the chat for you if, if you need it. Moving on to brand personality. A strong, clear brand personality allows a brand to stand out from competing brands. So for example, Apple make computers, so do hundreds of other brands. But Apple made themselves different because they differentiated from their competition by offering a brand with a creative, innovative, modern, passionate personality. The brand can set itself apart from the competition, not in the product or the service it offers, but in its personality. And this can be a key selling feature. You can't be liked by everyone, of course, but you can appeal to your core targets. Customers are much more likely to relate to your brand if they recognize their own characteristics in your brand personality, you know, human traits applied to a brand. Your brand personality will help customers understand what you're all about, attracting a certain type of customer who relates to your business and your product. This leads to the customer feeling connected to the brand. 
When they think about the brand, certain emotions will be evoked, which will in turn create positive associations and long-term customer loyalty. In simple terms, your brand allows you to make a personal connection with your audience and even make a consumer think certain things about your business, even before they step through the doors or call you. But consistency is key throughout all marketing activity and brand understanding helps your messages get heard. The brand personality system is built off of the 12 personality archetypes developed in the mid 20th century by Swiss psychiatrist psychiatrist and philosopher Carl Jung. He determined that these 12 personalities make up the collective unconscious. This means that we intrinsically already know these personalities. We don't have to be taught them. So for example, your brand might be the creator, which is naturally expressive, original and imaginative, or it might be the jester living in the moment, uh, always the life of the party, impulsive and unrestrained and not afraid to stand out. Of course, there are nuances and traits that cross over from one archetype to another, just like people. And I would say that Shake It Up Creative, my company, is a sage creator, a bit of a hybrid of the two. So which brand definition is closest to where you want to be? What is your personality archetype? If you were a type of animal or other brand, what would you be and why? They're all questions that you can ask yourself to try and determine your brand personality. Now, once you know your brand personality, it does give you clarity about how your brand looks, sounds and connects with your audience. It helps to create a language and tone that would resonate with them. you keeping customers coming back and turning them into raving fans because they not only love what you do, they love how you do it and how you make them feel. Positioning is the image that a product produces in the mind of customers in comparison to competitors' products and other products from the same company. Positioning also gives product or service a context. So you can position based on product product characteristics or benefits that are beneficial to customers. So for example, in the car industry, Toyota's position in the market is reliability. Porsche's position is performance and Volvo's position is safety. Brands consistently communicate the most unique benefit or characteristic of the product with their consumers. You can position on price or quality. You might even position on use or application. Another example is where meal replacement supplements can be of use to anyone lacking time or wanting a quick, convenient meal. There are also meal replacements designed specifically for people who want performance in the gym. So high in calories and added vitamins and minerals. Other meal replacements are for people on a diet. So they are low in calories and would not provide much energy for somebody's workout. Often the former meal replacement targets males and the diet low calorie option targets females. Both are meal, meal replacements, but they both have different positioning. The positioning statement is part of the positioning strategy. Customers will understand whether a brand is competing on price or quality or something else. And if you look at the graphic on the screen, that will just help you understand the areas where there's overlap and where it's risky and where actually your ideal positioning, which is between what you have to offer, but also what the customers actually want. Your value proposition is something that should be derived from your positioning. It explains how your product solves customers' problems or improves their situation, which is relevancy. How it delivers specific benefits, quantified value. It tells the ideal customer why they should buy from you and not from the competition, which is unique differentiation. Ideally, you should present your value proposition on your website homepage because it should be among the first things website visitors see when they interact your business. There is no hard and fast way to write this statement, 
but answering these questions will help you to cover everything and then you can reduce it down into something more impactful. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes now to just make some notes and go through those questions and start to form your value proposition statement before I move on to the next section. Now, normally people find that the first few parts are the easiest bits, and then it gets a little bit more tricky when you're trying to decipher actually what's actually your part. That's normal. So, um, you know, just make a start and then you can work on it a little bit later and refine it then. So moving on, I'm going to talk to you about purpose. Now, the mission statement, vision and values are traditionally the three most common descriptions of the business that explains why a company exists. But in recent years, another type of statement has also emerged in the business world and it's gaining more and more popularity. This type of statement is called the purpose statement. A purpose statement conveys a company's reason for existence, just as the mission statement and vision do, but it also shows the connection between the brand identity and the workplace culture of the company. It combines the comp components of a mission statement, vision and values into one single statement. And it's the essence of who you are as a company. A great example of this is the body shop. So as they say themselves, they, they've, got a, they've got a lot to say. And further down on this, this page of their website, they actually do have a complete manifesto, but at the core of everything they do, is their purpose of existing to fight for a fairer, more beautiful world. Now at a deeper level, it encompasses their beliefs that businesses can be a force for good, that everyone is beautiful and that equality is worth fighting for. And they do a lot of work to empower women and girls to actually back up their statement. On the visual branding and brand identity side, a business can set itself apart from its competitors. So with a carefully crafted brand identity, you can grow your influence and ultimately generate revenue. Now, there are some basic questions that you can ask yourself uh, just to get the, the, the basics right. And that is, you know, what's your brand logo and how will it be used? Do you have variations for certain usage? And I've just put an example on, on the screen there because for my business, we actually have uh, different variations of our logo that I use in presentations. Um, but the core one is always with that, that pink up. And we also have a version for um, a free support offering that we have called Shake It Hub. So there is, as you see on screen, a version of the logo that represents that part of our brand. But what are your brand's primary colors? Um, make sure that they are set in stone and that you're very consistent with those. What is your brand messaging and how will that be displayed? What typography will you use across your brand assets? Will you have any supporting graphics to be used with certain messages, uh, messaging on social media or perhaps on your website? What feeling are you trying to convey with your branding? One of the main reasons to have a brand identity in the first place is to be memorable and identifiable. After it's in place, consistency is extremely important. It also inspires trust in the customers that you're trying to reach. The brand image that you're trying to create in your consumer's minds is achieved by the assets that make up your brand identity. So in addition to your product or service quality and also your customer support, but it's ultimately defined by how you position your brand and how you differentiate your company. What does your brand offer that others don't? What will customers gain by paying attention to who you are and what you offer? 
What sets you apart from the competition in your industry? Brand colours, logos and matching images isn't enough if it isn't informed by the, what the brand is trying to achieve in the first place. It's important to decide how best to communicate the benefits of your product or service and how best to tell people about the features too. And this is known as having a brand voice, what your brand voice is. Now the benefit should always lead, and this is where your USC, USP also comes in, and that is um, unique um, selling proposition, if you're not familiar with that term. So you'll want to go through the copy that you have and improve it, make sure that it reflects your values, make sure it's consistent in how you refer to yourself. So are you a we or an I or an us? Look at the brand language that you already have in place or what you're going to be putting in place. You can decide what's acceptable. So does your brand use emojis or jokes? Is it more formal, corporate, or is it informal? Is it fun or serious? Do check that you don't overuse words and look for synonyms. Check that you're not using jargon or insider industry language unintentionally. Is everything clear? Could someone else read it and actually understand it very easily? Make sure that you simplify it down. You can always use A-B testing if you're not sure what's working. Have two different versions of a web page or an email and check which one gets the best results. But overall, just remember to be authentic. It's very, very important, especially with um, the younger generation who will totally see through fake messages or, you know, over dramatic messaging. They do really, really want that authenticity to build their trust in a brand. Now, here are some great examples of brand voice from Innocent Bowden and Lathwaite's Wine. And if you scroll through any of these brand social media feeds, you'll see that they actually maintain it day and night and it's not inconsistent at all. They're all very different styles. I thought it was quite a good example for you to see that, you know, we all think that everyone speaks to us in the same way that companies do that, but actually it can be wildly different. So how do you develop a succinct brand story? So there are five main steps to this and the hero's journey approach by Joseph Campbell makes a really good roadmap for the customer to enter and become a participant in the story. And this is why this approach is actually so good for brands. If the stories you tell reflect your brand values, the hero's journey becomes your brand story and your customers become participants in your story. So your brand story might be on a much smaller scale where the events are less dramatic but they can still carry emotional weight. Even the simplest story can be deeply moving. Just think of the John Lewis adverts, but actually it's a very simple story overall, but we all get completely drawn in and moved by the stories that they tell. What is most important about beginning a story with the call to adventure is that it sets the scene and it gives a reason for the hero to embark. The reader then begins to feel tension from the anticipation of not knowing how this journey will turn out. Step two is where the first step sets the journey in motion. And we need to hear about the hero's vulnerability about what lies ahead. So this might be about your business, you know, um, not being sure on how it can survive, you know, what, um, what people are looking for. It creates an empathetic, empathic, sorry, connection with the reader as they, they identify with the emotions being expressed. So it might be fear, trepidation, confusion, or upset. The emotional connection created in this moment provides an invitation to readers to join the story and share the hero's perspective. Step three is about the challenge. Conflict is the essence of a good drama but it doesn't mean that your company needs to be fighting dragons to be compelling. In brand stories, conflict is often framed as a challenge where the stakes are raised and the hero must dig a little deeper to overcome it. You get your reader's biggest emotional investment at this point as the hero's actions reflect their own struggles and the desire for a resolution is high. Then comes the moment of transformation. It's the moment where the hero's efforts pay off 
and it gives the greatest reward for the reader as it affirms that their investment in the hero's journey was worthwhile and they empathetically experienced the transformation themselves. Hearing about someone transformed in an authentic way gives us all hope that we can make great changes in our own lives or for our own businesses. The ending, of course, must have the hero returning home with a greater perspective than when they began. They must have got rid of their problems and had a wonderful experience. The transformation experience allows the person to live a better life than before. The reader is left inspired by the story and can now become the hero of his own situation. Now, it sounds like a lot, but this format can easily be applied to a brand story. You know, you realize there was a gap in the market for this, but oh, you couldn't do it because this might be a problem, but then this happened and you overcame it. And then there was a moment of transformation and everything is brilliant. And here we are providing these products or services to you as the customer. How do you communicate that story? Now, according to the Content Marketing Institute's 2019 B2C content marketing trends, only half of marketers frequently use storytelling in their marketing. But storytelling is so powerful because it triggers a biological response. When you're invested in a good story, your brain physically responds to it. Once you define your customer persona, you can write your story using language that resonates with them. There are five steps to communicating your story. Explore the key messages and statements that you want people to know. Then identify the evidence that backs those statements up. They accompany each, each message. Then identify your key stakeholders or customers and understand their communication channels and their customer journey. Next, agree who your spokespeople or champions are going to be. Who you pick to tell your story and how they tell it will say a huge amount about your product or your brand. Then the fifth and final step is to develop a communication strategy, which will help you convey your messages in the channels where your target audience will be able to discover it. And I mean all of your stakeholders and your customers when I say target audience. So once you've completed a piece of content, you obviously don't want to be the only one that's talking about it. Encourage people to share your story by making it easy for them to do so. Take on brand ambassadors if you can, or if it's relevant. Publish your story to your blog, to your email list, share it on social media, include it in presentations. Optimize your web content for SEO, make a video for it. There's a hundred ways. Internal branding is ensuring that your team or employees know about the brand in detail, especially the company goals and external branding. Internal branding lets employees live the brand by understanding the brand identity so that they can also become brand advocates. An internal branding campaign connects employees with the external brand. Brand building efforts inside of a business work together with external brand building practices to achieve the best results for a company. In the absence of internal branding, there is no knowledge within the employees, your team, about the brand. An employee can be a real game changer for brands. When they understand the brand value and they believe in it, they champion the company's good days, products and actions. The whole idea of internal branding lies in having the outcome of a positive reputation and the building of credibility. A Nielsen report says that 84% of people trust recommendations from colleagues, friends and family over other marketing efforts. The stat on the screen was identified by a company called MSL Group, and this is when it was compared to the same messages shared by official brand social media channels. But actually, they did so much better when they were shared by employees of the brand. Posters, newsletters and notice boards are simply not enough here. It takes some engaging and creative communications efforts delivered by company leaders at the right time to even start to resonate with employees. Talking with employees is the most effective way to know what they need, how they feel about the brand and what it is about the brand that they're actually proud of. Internal research and surveys are a good starting point. 
And if you want to read a little bit more about internal branding, there is um, a Harvard Business Review article, uh, which you'll get the link for, and you can have a read of that at your leisure. Since your employees are your primary brand ambassadors, they need to know and understand your brand better than everyone else. At all times, they should be reflecting your brand beliefs and values. The more engaged with your brand your employees are, the better they will serve your customers. And it's not just for big businesses either. They will attract better business and increase your profits, whatever your size. First, share your short and long-term plans with the business, with the, for the business with your team and then be sure that everyone is clear in, on their role in that ambition and that they are willing to help achieve it. Make sure that you understand your employees, what motivates them, what dreams they personally have, what they might need help with. Ensure that they are actively engaged and can be fulfilled at work. You need to be inclusive and foster good teamwork. Ask, are they proud to work for you? And do they understand the business and its products? Next, you need to make sure that they understand the customers and that they listen to them. Get their ideas on how to improve the customer service and how the company can further solve customer problems. Regular team activities with a focus on the company values are a great way to motivate people and share the vision further. Brand guidelines is the name for a document that essentially sets a rule, that essentially is a set of rules that explain how your brand works. So these guidelines typically include basic information such as an overview of your brand's history, vision, personality, and key values, your brand messaging or your mission statement, including examples of tone of voice. The logo usage will be in there, where and how to use your logo, including minimum sizes, spacing, and what not to do with it. The colour palette, so you show your primary and secondary colour palettes with colour code breakdowns for print, screen, and web. Also the type style, so showing the specific font that you use, or you might have a collection of fonts for your, um, your business, and details of those font families and where to find them. Image style and photography, so examples of um, photographs that work really well for the brand and the style of images that you might pick for social media posts, for example. Business card and letterhead design, so examples of how the logo and font are used for standard company literature and also, you know, editorial guidelines going back to the tone of voice. It's a really useful document for a, a freelance designer or a marketing agency to have, and they will usually ask for it if you want any creative work done for your company. So once you've formalized all of your brand um, ideas and elements, you can produce this document and have it as a point of reference for your team and for external people doing work for you as well. So I wanted to give you um, a good example of brand and positioning of a company that's you know started really small with just two people and has grown up um, considerably over the years. Has anyone heard of Tool or maybe you're, you're a user of Tool? You can see their visual mark or their brand logo here on the screen. Now Tool is actually the name, the brand name of the product. The name of the company is the Provenance Company. Twine from wool is not a new idea. But 10 years ago, down in rural Devon, this company was born. And it's very much part of its community and both its business operations. Remember all that inside brand stuff that I've talked about, as well as the products, branding, communications are absolutely rooted in sustainability and consideration for the environment. In 2014, they won the RHS Chelsea Garden Product of the Year, and they've done it several times again since. And you don't win that by putting a great brand around a poor product. They've also extended their product range to include different colours, along with ropes, twine holders, gardener soaps and tape, table placemats as well. So let's have a look in more detail. Here on the left is twool. Wine made from, uh, twine, <laughs> definitely not wine, twine made from wool. And next is polypropylene twine 
then jute and sizewood vines. Now jute and sizewood are raw materials that are grown halfway around the world and are usually processed a lot in factories with questionable levels of, of standards of pay for workers and polypro, polypro, propylene, can't say it properly today, um, is a petroleum based plastic. Tool, on the other hand, is made from 100% natural British wool that supports the continuation of a rare breed of sheep, the white face. Wool is one of the oldest naturally occurring fibres around. It's a practical material that lasts and we grow it well in this company, in, the, in this country. It's renewable, it's super sustainable and is currently an under, underused natural resource. Um, so Tool has a real true eco promise. Now, tool products perform just as well, if not better, than the competitor products. They look great, they feel great, they add nitrogen back into garden soil when they break down, and they cost only about 50 pence more. The company uses low impact dye, which uses less water in the rinse process too. Plus, tool, I think, is a brilliant name for this product. Their products do not fall into the horrible trap of green products equals poor products. Look, at, Take a look at, at the tool packaging. Even that alone suggests that this product is superior and important. And on their website, you'll find brilliant language such as legal gubbins and join our flock for their email sign up. This is a great example of a small company's sustainability strategy combined with good design and brand and engaging, honest communications. So that brings me to the end of the main part of the presentation. I do just want to tell you what's coming up next week. The customer session is all about understanding your different audiences and how to reach them, mapping customer journeys. And we've also got one on Thursday, which is search engine marketing, both delivered by the Creative Bloom team. And that's about site structure and um, SEO, content backlinks and all of those things. So have a look on Eventbrite and sign up if you think that that is something you'd benefit from. Now, I would like to just run that poll again and see how your um, understanding of branding has, uh, has improved. So just bear with me a second, just going to relaunch that. If you can just complete that, that'd be great. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much. And I'll just share those um, results if I can so that you can see them. There we go. Great news, 85% are now confident. Thank you. So I want to tell you now about the other support that's available with this series. Um, I know that we've got a few of our digital champions here today. By coming on one of these sessions, you have now got access to eight hours of free specialist support from one of um, seven digital and business experts. They are known as the digital champions. So you can take the knowledge that you've and the ideas that you've got from these webinars and then use them to help with implementation or finding the right tools for you. You can go to c2cbusiness.org.uk the link is coming in the chat in a second um, to request that support if you think that it's something that you would like your, your company to benefit from. Now, they are experts, the seven experts, and they range from uh, being experts in consulting to technology to marketing. But between us all, I am one of these as well. We cover all aspects of digital adoption. So do take the opportunity and inquire if you would like those free eight hours of support. Um, again, the link is there for you to look into. And please do chat. I think we've got Malcolm, Lisa, um, there might be a couple of others that have come on today. Do catch them in a minute when we've got an opportunity to, to chat if you would like to ask any questions about that. And the other uh, business support programs that are currently available the business hot house which is partially match funding so 
you would pay, um, you would apply for a grant and then you would pay 60% of that and you would get 40% back, which is a great offer. Um, you do need to do some things like complete um, a business plan and some other bits of paperwork. But again, that's an offer to all of you, your businesses at different levels. There's also the low case, which is an EU funded project to help businesses adapt to climate change and um, get moving towards being a low carbon company. And then there's also RISE as well. So that's all about innovation and you can apply for a research and innovation grant to be able to do innovation projects through RISE. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and come on to um, the webinar as group. If anyone would like to ask any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. If you'd like to have a chat with one of the digital champions, then please do in the messages. Um, and let's just have a bit of a mini network. Thank you so much for coming today. Hi, Rachel, I had a question. Hi. Um, and firstly, just so I thought that was a really excellent presentation. Thank you, I've made oh, loads, okay. loads of notes and I've learned lots. Good. So um, a question I put in the chat box, um, when you did the personality archetypes yes, um, and they each had colours, so you said, for example, yours is kind of sage wisdom. I've, I've seen colours before connected with brands, but I've never seen that kind of level of detail. So my question was, are those kind of specific colours connected to those archetypes or is it yeah. just a color wheel no they're actually not it, the colors are just for the graphics so the archetypes are they it's actually sage as in not the color um they have all yeah, those wisdom names yeah. yeah it's just to make it look pretty <laughs> so, um, so no but there is um there are people that do specialize in in you know color association mm -hmm. with branding um, but I, yeah, I don't know lots about that, I'm afraid, but no, I think it's open to, to choice. Okay, thank you. No, that's okay. Maddie, did we have any other questions come in the chat? No. Um, I think Andrew's got his hand up. Was there yeah, just to, uh, as, a, as a kind of fellow kind of digital marketer, Rachel, um, it's something that's always perplexed me, really. I really like what you covered about storytelling, which, uh, as you say, uh, unfortunately, less than half marketers actually seem to do it effectively. Mm -hmm. But I'm really intrigued with car adverts that you always see on the television. The, the messaging that goes along with them seems to be so woolly and vague and unusual <laughs> that they don't seem to have anything to do with storytelling. Have you, have you got a view on why they are so kind of oblique and strange in their messaging? I think because it's so easy for um, car brands to focus on features. They're really trying to move as far away from that as possible. They're trying to evoke a certain feeling in their customer. So they want people to imagine that they're in this, you know, brilliant mountainous environment, driving carefree down, down the roads or whatever it is, you know, and just kind of inspire people and make that emotional connection. And that's why I think they always feel a little bit woolly because it's not, we've got, this, 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 it's more about an overall feel. That would be my, my uh, assumption. <laughs> <laughs> I had no answer either. I really just, it seems, I, I think I agree with you, but yeah. uh, it, it just seems odd if you're selling something that's 20, 30, 40,000 yeah. pounds that the messaging isn't much sharper. Yeah, some of them are very, very vague, aren't they? <laughs> Indeed. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to ask? Would, yeah, hi Rachel. Hiya. Um, hiya. Um, what I tend to find is, um, which uh, I think um, which would be quite good, would be um, having humour in some of the adverts because yeah. uh, obviously we're we're coming out of a pandemic. It's all doom and gloom. You you put the the Sky News Channel on or something. Every <laughs> other advert is like, oh give money to this charity or help say and and it it does get quite depressing um every advert being you know something pulling on the heartstrings yeah. whereas like, i think i think with a, a bit of comedy 
happy. Um, you know, there's that happy emotion that people are like, yeah, you know, and, um, and, and don't mind having the adverts on because I, I just put the mute yeah. on, you know. Yeah, so uh, you're saying, I, I think it's difficult because it, the humor is not always appropriate for every brand. Um, mm. But certainly um, there is room for that, for more of that, I'm sure. If people got a bit more creative, it would lift the advert breaks a lot, wouldn't it? definitely definitely yeah thank i mean you can that. you i mean with your brand you know obviously you're a jewelry brand how would you yeah. see humor applying to to what you do well yeah i wasn't looking at my one I, I've, <laughs> I've only just done my video I, I was quite chuffed with my video so i was sort of like i yeah. thought right i'm going to do something that other people aren't doing so yeah. you've got, got to try and think of different things but i i definitely think um, in these times with the pandemic and, and everything else, um, I think happy, happy emotions and, and getting people, you know, and jewellery is happy because, you know, you're making yourself feel good and like, you know, you've got a party to go to or like, you know, family yeah. celebration and things like that. <laughs> so, um, and, and not kind of pulling on the, the heartstrings of, um, of, yeah, certain things. I, and I completely, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for helping and, and that sort of thing but when when it's sort of continue on on the news channels yeah. and things like that it, it just gets so draining this is it and then it's very hard for them to stand out isn't it yeah yeah definitely mm. thank you yeah okay. Rachel can I ask can I ask about uh, positioning it's an interesting one so so you mentioned when you're doing your brand and positioning yeah. um so you mentioned about price for example uh and you mentioned about quality um and interestingly the other one's sort of service but where where does the sort of technology bit come in and the innovation bit um is that an area of positioning that products can actually use as well yeah, it can be as long as it's not feature led, you know, it's got to be um, where it delivers benefit to the customer. Um, I know that there are companies that are, you know, software, very, very tech focused companies that have um, had to sort of reposition because they're seeing, they were seen as one thing, but actually the outcome is more aligned with, with something else. So the descriptions that they have to use and the way that they're, they're portrayed has had to change in, in line with that. There's an actually, actually a brilliant book, if you want to read more about positioning and understand it more, um, by April Dunford. Um, she's an expert in, in positioning. Um, i trying to remember what it's called now. Um, but look her up, April Dunford, and I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll find it. It's really good. Can I answer anything else? Um, or does anybody want to connect with Digital Champion? Whilst we're here, I know there's a lot of um, cameras not on. I feel like I whizzed through that, but hopefully everyone here has got some benefit from it. And if there's nothing else, then we will sign off for today. Right. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming everyone. And I uh, hope to see you on some future sessions. Thank you very much, Rachel. Nice to see Bye. everyone. Bye. Thanks, Rachel.